For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis, uh, we're looking at Genesis. Now, we're in, we're in the book of 1 Timothy and the second chapter, and we last time studied verses 9 and 10. We'll come back to those in a moment. But my lesson today, last week my lesson was Operation Fig Leaves, and we, talk, and we taught it from 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, Clothes and Cosmetics. Today, I'm going to show you where it comes from and deal with the specific passage. It comes from Genesis, the third chapter. I'm going to pick this up where we meet the serpent in verse 4. Now, I'm going to read from verses 4 through 11 to you, and I want you to follow an outline. So I want you to put the outlines not on your paper, so I want you to put this at the head of your paper. Genesis, verses 3 and 4. Five and uh, six and seven, four and five, then six and seven, and then eight through eleven. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. In verses four and five, it talks about the serpent. Serpent. In verse six and seven, the sin. Verses eight through eleven, the signs of consequences of sin. The signs of consequences of sin. Now, that's our outline of the text, okay? I'm going to read through it, and I want you to pay attention to my outline. The serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you surely shall not die. Now, in the second chapter, verse 17, God gave them the commandment of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He said, in the day you eat from the tree, dying you will die. He says, that's not going to happen. All right? He says, he says to her, you surely shall not die. Dying, you will not die. In verse 5, he said, so that's the first thing. In other words, he just flat comes out and contradicts what God had told them as a commandment. The second thing he tells them, is very interesting. See, apparently she was disturbed about this idea of eating from the tree and dying you shall die. And in the Hebrew, it's muth muth, that's a word for dying. It's a, it's a cal infinitive with a cal imperfect, or a cal imperfect with a cal infinitive, and it doubles the meaning. He's saying, die, surely you shall die. Actually, he's saying, dying, you will die. And he's talking about a double death. He's talking about dying spiritually and dying physically. And the devil says, ah, that's not going to happen. Well, they sinned, and physically they didn't, but spiritually they did. But he contradicts that. He says, that's not going to happen. And then the next thing he says to, to, to her, remember, he's speaking to the woman. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. Now watch this. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now they were already like God. Because they had been made in the image according to the likeness of God. They, already, they, were, they were made... You know, in the first chapter, verses 26 and 27, they were already made in the image and likeness of God. Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay? Now, we have a conflict of two promises. We have a conflict of two promises and this is the angelic conflict. On one side is God and the word of God. On the other side is the devil who is trying to mess it up. There are two belief systems. 
there is the word of God belief system and there was the world belief system that's run by the devil. Do you see that? Well, you better see it because it's going to bite you every day. All right. Now, listen, now watch this. In both arenas, here you have the word of God and here you have the world. Promises are made. Did God promise him something? He said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Die and you will die. Did the devil promise him something? You go ahead and eat. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, right? And you will know good from evil. You see him trying to mimic See, he's, a, he's an angel of disguise. He's an angel of darkness. All right. Now, I just want you to be able to see that because this is the angelic conflict. This is what goes on in our life. If you think this is old stuff, no, nah, man, this is, this is 21st century right here. Now, now, let's take a look at 8, 9, 10, 11. Let's see, in verse uh, 6 and 7. When the wo verse 6 and 7. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was delight to the eye, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she's, she's doing all this in herself. This is in her dialogue. You know, here's where it gets you. This is in her dialogue. So she took the fruit. I keep talking about inner dialogue in your life and gave it to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loin coverings. Now isn't that interesting? Why do you think loin coverings? Let me tell you why. Just get it off the plate. All right? Because your head's going the wrong way. So let's just get it off the plate. It is because of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman is Christ. You compare Genesis 3.15 with Galatians 3.15, where the seed is Jesus Christ, and you understand this. You see, this is the angelic conflict. And listen, the warfare is over Christ. All right. Eight, nine, now we're in eight. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is Bible study time. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Listen to me. He has covered himself and still considers himself naked. Right? Come on now. He said, Woo! I ate the fruit and I became naked. Right? So he covered himself. They both covered themselves. Now he's in the presence of God and he's got a problem. He feels naked. So what did he lose? Listen to me. Listen to me what he lost. He lost his spiritual innocence. I'm going to explain it. Well, it goes on. Who told you that you were naked? Listen to me. When he says in the previous verse, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Listen, the clothes weren't enough. 
And do you know why he's hiding himself? Because the inner man is naked. And outer can't do it. He has to go in hiding. He has to, listen, the outer is not enough. He covers the outer. It's not enough. He has to cover the whole person. He has to hide the whole person. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which it commands you not to eat? And of course, now we get into the discipline part. But you see, the serpent, the sin, you see that? And then the signs of the consequences of the sin. See, everything now, he's talking about the consequences. He's living, he is living in the reality of the consequences of his sin. And listen, he, he used, he thought if he covered the outer part, but there was still the inner part the inner man that went screaming bloody murder within his head, I am naked before God. And then he had to hide his whole body. And that wasn't enough either, was it? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the morning study. I just want to show you where Operation Fig Leaves come from. And it hasn't changed a bit. It hasn't changed. There is still, Paul, Paul is talking about Operation Fig Leaves in 1 Timothy 2 to his congregation, and I'm in the 21st century talking to mine. Let's pray. I give you this moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, the way to take care of the hiding from the, of the inner man from the presence of God is to confess your sin if you're a believer. If not, then you need to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead so that he can clothe the inner man with righteousness. To clothe the inner man with righteousness, a righteousness that will never go away because it's given to you by grace, like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him, Christ. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. If you're a believer, then you've got to get yourself cleansed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, then here's the promise. God will extend the work of Christ to the Christian life in the idea of confession. He said, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you which restores that idea to fellowship. Father, we're so thankful today. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls as it's supposed to be in Bible study. I pray for, for not only for those who are in attendance here, but for those who are in attendance on the Internet. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we introduced you to 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 and took you over to Peter's comment in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, where they were both commenting on the subject of the spiritual role of Christian women in the church, the home, and the world. And Paul and Peter both were dealing with cosmetics and clothing. The point that Paul and Peter were making was the emphasis on the daily developing the inner beauty of the man or the woman. In the case of their discussion, they were on women, true as men as well. Paul and Peter both taught in the importance of placing daily emphasis on the inner spiritual beauty as well as the outer beauty. Peter said, and this, watch this, now I put in bold print, he said, your adornment must not be merely external. Let it be the hidden person of the heart. Now, if you'll go over with me to 1 Timothy, where, where we were last week, I want to pick up at verse 10. I want to show you something unique about verse 10 in regard to the Greek Bible. Because there are some things the Greek does for emphasis that the English doesn't. 
Now, the way it reads in the New American Standard Bible, 1 Timothy 2.10, but rather by means of good works, good and works as genitive, plural, neuter, as, which, listen, hoss is a relative pronoun. It's a relative pronoun used as subject. It is a relative pronoun used as a subject. It's nominative sing singular neuter. This is a rare occasion where a relative pronoun does not have an antecedent. Doesn't have an antecedent. Usually you identify a relative pronoun by the antecedent, uh, by its gender and its number. In other words, masculine singular or something. Not, not necessarily its case. But this is one of those times that the antecedent is not there because it is used as a subject. A relative pronoun is used as a subject. But rather by good works, as is proper, to be, which means to be conspicuous or distinguished by godliness for women making a claim professing to godliness. Godliness, as we talked about last night, is the priority of devotion to God, which develops the inner beauty. Okay? Now watch what the Greek Bible did. Watch, watch what the Greek Bible did. Because this is the way it was originally written. It begins with, but what? The word what is correct. It's a relative pronoun. As doesn't show you it's a relative pronoun. What does? Because it's neuter. Normally the word hoss as a relative pronoun is who or her. If it's a who, it has to be identified if it's a male or female. If it's neuter, it's what? The Greeks identified this relative pronoun properly as what? For what is proper for women professing godliness by means, this is the literal Greek, by means of good works. In other words, Proverbs 31 talks about the noble woman, talking about the, the woman believer. In Proverbs 31, it's a very famous, everybody knows, it's the last chapter in the last verse. 3131, and the last part of the verse, it says this, and this is what Paul is talking about. And let her, the godly woman, and let her, the godly work, and let her, the godly woman's works, praise her in the gates. That's exactly what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the godly woman who ha has reached spiritual maturity as maintaining, we call that super grace, that, that, that Christian woman who is professing. Now that word professing is an interesting word. Up there in the New American Standard, I wrote the word. It means, it means professing or announcing um, on a consistent basis. It means to profess something on a consistent basis. And what is, what is she professing is godliness. And how was she professing it? By her good works. In other words, her spiritual maturity is going to be reflected in her devotion to God, and her devotion to God is going to be reflected in the way she conducts herself in her family, in her church, and in the world. And Paul, or, uh, and the writer of Proverbs talks about this as a noble or a spiritual mature woman. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. The, Paul is getting his references out of Genesis 3, and he's getting them out of Proverbs. These were landmark passages on women. These were the landmark passages on women. I mean, there are very few funerals of women that you will ever go to that somebody doesn't quote out of Proverbs 31 if they've been a noble woman. 
if the church has recognized their spiritual maturity and their godliness, their devotion to Christ. And it is evidenced by the way they conduct themselves. Uh, in the way they conduct themselves, which is called good works. Now, I want to talk about five things about Operation Fig Leaves. First, Peter used Sarah. When Peter wrote on this subject in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, he writes through 7, but on 7 he talks to the husbands. But in the first six verses of 1 Peter, he uses Sarah as an example of what he was teaching about the godly woman and, and, her, and her appearance. Uh, a woman in the Bible who didn't just work on the external of her beauty, but on the internal of her beauty. Peter uses Sarah as an example of the visual reflection of the inner spiritual beauty of a Christian woman or a believing mature woman, a godly woman who is in the world. All right? The world is not in her. She's in the world as a devoted person of Christ. Do you understand the difference? The world's not in her. She's in the world. And and. Every day she works on two sides of her beauty. One is the outer and one is the inner. Can I tell you how important that is in your life? Not just as women, but as men. But for women, both men have said, this is really important for your influence upon your home, upon your church, and upon the world for Christ. It should be a daily thing, just like you comb your hair, put your makeup on, do your lipstick, do all that stuff, get the right coordination of your clothes. That's all. Listen, that's fine. I'm all, I'm all for that. But not by neglecting the inner beauty. You, you, if you ne neglect the inner beauty, if you neglect doing the inner beauty cosmetic spiritual idea, the outer is not going to carry you. You know, listen. The outer beauty is decaying. Agreed? Come on. But the inner beauty is being renewed day by day. You understand that? When you work on the inner beauty, see, you work on the outer beauty because it's decaying. It's rotting on the bone. I know. But the inner beauty, the reason you work on it, because even though the outer beauty is getting wrinkled and, and withered and all those other things that go with it, everything's sagging. It's a normal process of life because of Adam's sin. But listen, if you work on the inner, the inner, the inner is being renewed. It's, it's being renewed day by day. And listen, the inner beauty will overshine. Listen to me now. The inner beauty will overshine the outer decaying. The inner beauty will overshine the outer problems. This is why he used Sarah as an example. Sarah, at the age of 65, Pharaoh of Egypt saw her in her beauty and desired it. Her husband in Genesis 12, 11 said she's beautiful and understood the world wanted her beauty. And he's not talking about just outer beauty. He's talking about the package of beauty. A 
That's why he used Sarah. Because even though she was 65 in years of age, girls, and her 65 was no different than your 65. Because she kept the inner person up to speed with what was her going on in her life. The inner beauty showed outside and made her a beautiful person at 65. And world, the world saw it and desired it. Let me show you something else. At the age of 89, at the age of 89, King Abimelech saw Sarah's inner spiritual beauty and he desired it, and now she's 89. Oh, listen to me, girls. It's the same 89 as yours. This is not the, this is not the antediluvian period. This is the present world in which we live. In Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who reverences the Lord shall be praised. And then verse 31 tells us. In Matthew 23, in verses 27 and 28, when we're in the woes, Jesus talks about this in a very simple way. He says, outer beauty, outer beauty is like a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. Full of dead bones. Whitewashed tombstone looks good on the outside, but inside, what's there? What's inside a tomb on the inside? Dead bones. You see, conversion, salvation brings the woman into a different climate completely where she can develop the inner person and take it from a dead state to a living state and then develop the living state that is greater than the outer state that is going to normally decay and one day die. Right? The body we live in. Maybe you've heard the world say, like I've heard, beauty is skin deep, but ugly is to the bone. Solomon stated it this way. He said, a ring of gold in a pig's nose. So is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion, spiritual discretion. A good example of that woman would have been Queen Jezebel, beautiful woman on the outside, queen, wife of King Ahaz, inside dead men bones. The second thing that I'd like to remind you of today, clothes and com cosmetics, as Paul and Peter both discuss to the Christian woman, Clothes and cosmetics complement the body, but not the soul. Only the word of God complements the soul. If you want to be a beautiful woman, work on the outside, but not, don't neglect the inside. If you're going to neglect something, don't neglect the inner beauty. That's forever. The outer beauty is what's temporal. And I tell you, based on the truth of the word of God, if you'll work the inner, the inner will shine out to the outer and you'll be more beautiful than you could ever be outer without the inner beauty. Listen, clothes and cosmetics can make you feel good about how you look on the outside, but not on how you feel about the person in you, the real person. You know, when... when when Peter talked about the hidden man of the heart up there in 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, you remember that? 
Do you know the word hidden is interesting? It's, it's, it's kratos, it's K-R-U-P-T-O-S. This word is translated hidden or secret, concealed. That can see the, the real you, the inner person of the heart where you have inner dialogue. Be sure that's open to God and not concealed, shut down, hidden, or you've got a life in secret. talking to a guy the other day. He's got problems out here. He's lying to his people, stealing and cheating, playing the con game with his own family, playing his con game with his family. Ask him why. Because I have an addiction. You see, what is happening out here has a cause here. Are you with me? See, that's a layer. I just want a layer. I ask him, where did you get, where did this, where did this cause come from? Where did that addiction come from? And he wanted to tell me why. He wanted to tell me how he got it. He wanted to tell me how he got it. Well, when I was a boy, I was reared with God. I said, stop right there. I got time to, I don't want, I'm not interested in how you got it. I'm interested in why you got it. Because you see, it's not the how. The how, the how is all, were all the excuses. That's when God interviewed uh, Adam and Eve, it was all about the how, not about the why. And if I can get to the why, then I can get to another layer with inside his psyche. Because you see, what I'm dealing with is somebody who is covering up, who is concealing, who is hiding, who is playing another life in secret that God wants to expose. And when I can get him to talk about why he clicked into it, and he, and he says, oh, well, you know, I was, I, was a, I was always fearful. I was not very social. And I found that when I did that, it brought me out of my shell. N now I've gone, I'm into a third level of his problem that he's concealed, he's hidden, that's not even open to God. And then when I ask him, well, tell me about that. He wanted to go to a how. I said, I'm not interested in the how. I'm interested in the why. And what I'm telling you, that your life and my life is about a series of hiding, of concealing, that God wants exposed in your life and wants you to deal with it. Cosmetics and clothing covered up but doesn't deal with it. It is a matter of the heart. That's where the word of God works. Hebrews 4.12, into the innermost being becomes a critic of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And if you're not willing to deal with that, You'll play this goofy game of outer man, inner man, and your inner man is so tormented that no matter how good the outside gets, the inside is whacked out. The church is full of these people today. You've got to let the Word of God and the Holy Spirit deal with the inner man in your life if you want to get well. If you want to get well, 
you've got to let the Word of God become a critic and thought of your heart, and you've got to be willing to change that. And I'll tell you something, sad as it makes my heart, there are few believers that are willing to do it. That saddens me because we'll never change the world because you are not devoted to the inner man to bring the inner man out of the closet. Everybody talks about, ah, it's good to have him out of the closet. I want the people in the church to get out of the closet in their heart. Quit playing this dual life. You're a double-minded person and unstable in all of your ways. That's what I'm talking about. Let me show you, let me give you an example you might have missed. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, 61, Jesus has been in court and they've drug him through the, through the ringer. And he walks out of court into the courtyard. And as he walks out of the courtyard, passing the bonfire, he looks over at the bonfire and he finds Peter. Right after Peter has denied the Lord the third time. I want you to see what happened without words. To see the dynamics of the inner man. In Luke, it says the Lord turned as he was going through the courtyard and passing the bonfire. The Lord turned and he looked at Peter. Peter's standing right there. Peter had stood at a specific place at the bonfire because he was caught between the Lord over here and the gate over here. But what was unique about his position is that he was in place for the Lord to walk by and catch his eye. And the Lord turned and he looked. This word for looked in blippo means a penetrating look. You know what that means? It means he looked deep into his eyes. There's a couple people that can do that. One person who's really in love. They can sit and stare into those eyes till. Three o'clock in the morning. Then after a while, we can't, well, anyhow. And the others, ki little kids and, and mamas, little kids and mamas. It's the darndest thing I ever saw. Those little kids, they just, mamas said, that deer, deer, deer in headlights. Very few of us ever look people in the eye. We don't live in a culture anymore that looks people in the eye and talks. It's very seldom you can get a teenager to hold eye contact with any length of time. They just melt away. They go, I'm too nervous with you. But this was a moment. This was a a deer and headlight moment when Jesus walking by caught his eye and buddy, there it was. Deer and headlights. And when that happened, without a word being said, Peter, inner dialogue, Peter remembered the word of the Lord. You see that Hebrews 5.12 had gone in. And the word of God, Jesus looked deep into his eyes, and the word of God of Hebrews 4.12 put him under conviction. 
became a critic and thought and the tensions of his heart. Do you not see that? Do you not see that? And how he had told him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Jesus in Matthew, the 6th chapter, 22 and 23, says the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is clear, has a singleness of mind with God, your whole body is full of light. But if your, if your eye is evil, which happened to Adam and Eve, they had a clear eye, now they've got, they're spiritually blind. If your eye is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And notice it wasn't a question. That wasn't a question. That was a declaration of truth. Did you see the exclamation? It's in your Bible. Paul in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 talks about the eyes of your heart being able to enlighten you. The eyes of your heart being able to enlighten you. That's what Jesus is talking about. In Proverbs 15, 30, the writer talks about the bright eye gladdens the heart. You know what that means? It means a mere perception of something good in your life Puts a smile on you. Just the, mere, just the mere thought of having something turn good. Just the mere thought that you've interviewed for a job. It's the job you would like. Everything is right. Just the mere thought that you could get that job. That God would honor you enough to give you that job. And that job could take care of the needs you have in your family. And, and everything just can bring a smile to your face. Can put can lighten up you, just enlightens you. And when your soul is enlightened, your eyes sparkle. Oh, man, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've stood in the background speaking to a, a, hus, a, a, a groom and a bride. The groom has fear in his eyes. She's crystal clear. There's a brightness. There's a glow. There's, I mean, whoa. When they get back from the honeymoon, it's opposite. You can't get the smile off his face. His eyes glow like crazy, and she just looks like, Well, I need to stop and take a break there. When we come back, I'm going to conclude this. In the second service, you want to be sure. This is not a good time to leave. This time, we're about to get into it. We're going to have a word of prayer. The men is going to take the offering. And then we're going to take a 15-minute break with donuts and coffee and other things downstairs, I guess, Deanna. Who knows? Well, there'll be something down there. I made coffee, so I know there's there. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way to study with us today, Father, and those who understand the importance of this ministry, both on a local and, uh, and, and only you, Father, know how far it might spread uh, through the Internet. Uh, give their money. They don't give it out of law. They give it out of love. And that's exactly how we want as a man purposes in his heart and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and out of his spiritual growth he gives. And we'll be good stewards of it, Father. We'll keep very little on our own operation and spend as much as we can, Father, to push the gospel as far as it can be pushed by this church. And I pray for that. I pray today, Father, that the offering be taken. We will be generous. It is, it is a love offering that we present for the great work that you've had through this church in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, in the first hour, in Operation Fig Leaves, 
we talked about the Genesis passage from what it originated, as well as Paul bringing it and Peter both bringing it into clothes and cosmetics. If you have your study guide, I'm at point three in our second service. When we first met Adam and Eve, they did not have a spiritual problem with nakedness as adults in the presence of the Lord. We read this in Genesis 2.25. It reads, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Were not ashamed. Now look, that means when the lights were on. <laughs> they were not ashamed. Okay? They didn't have any problem with it in the presence of the Lord. In this state of spiritual innocence, they were not ashamed of their nakedness, much like a toddler with his parents. I mean, who hasn't seen that little toddler? I mean, the less clothes, the happier he is. Right? It's the mother who runs around after him, worried about whether he's been properly potty trained. But little, little toddlers and nakedness is just the cutest sight you could ever see in it. Now, you don't care about looking at that 80, but... At eight months, that's not bad. This is the nakedness. This is innocence. That's why it's so cute. It's just pure innocence. And this is the way Adam and Eve were, it's spiritually speaking. Their nakedness uh, was not an issue until their sin. And what's interesting is you have at one time mentioned in chapter 2, in this great passage, they were married. And uh, their nakedness was a plus, not a minus. But when you get to the third chapter, and they eat and commit the sin of verse 6 and 7 of Genesis 3, then, then three times nakedness is mentioned in a negative way. It's mentioned in a negative way in verse 7 when it says their eyes were opened to this idea. In verse 10, their nakedness made them fearful of God. And verse 11, uh, in the question, who told you that you were naked? So three times, it's used in a negative sense because it is a, their nakedness now is affecting their life and their behavior and their relationship with God. This is a first. This is a first. And what is it they've lost? They've lost their innocence. They've lost their spiritual innocence in the fall. Prior to the fall, their spiritual innocence was reflected in their relaxed mental, spiritual mental attitude towards both their nakedness and their relationship with the Lord. They didn't have a problem with their nakedness nor with their relationship with the Lord. <laughs> it is after the fall, after their sin and spiritual death, that this becomes an issue. Now their attitude has changed. They are completely looking at themselves and God, and life in a completely different idea. Instead of having a relaxed mental attitude, they're in a chaotic mental attitude. They're, they're jumping all over the place in their head. They're in chaos. And their solution to their unspiritual nakedness was human goods, works. Operation Fig Tree. Uh, Operation Fig Leaves, as we read in Genesis, uh, ver, uh, uh, ver, our passage 4 through 11. What is interesting to me is about the family. <clears throat> Much of what goes on in a person's life, early in their life, in their, in their young learning stages, is family-oriented. Sometimes they have to correct some behavioral patterns in order to get, to get into a different place in their life. I'll give you an example of it. It's the first family. In the first family, in the firstborn of that family that is, has gone through this processing, the firstborn of that family did the same thing that mom and dad did. Operation Works. He was told 
what kind of an offering to bring. He chose to bring an offering that he wanted to bring. He chose a different offering. Operations, fruit of the earth. And you see, the idea behind this, even though we have operation this and operation that, even though it's the same operation, but just different stuff, but it's the same mindset, operation works. Where only grace take care of it, they thought works could. Only God in his grace could make the proper provisions for what was going on in the life. And there's a clear picture here of family and life. And they're connected. And it's important that we understand that the influence of behavior in our, in our families and how it influences out upon our children. And sometimes they really struggle in their life because they don't have the background. You had to overcome something. You had the maturity and the background and the word of God and all these other things to overcome some of that. But they, they don't see that. They only see the struggle. They don't understand the solution. And the first thing you know, you've got this on your children. And it's manifested in, a, in some type of behavior. And all of a sudden, the parents are like, uh, their breath is taken away. And, and let me tell you, when that is true, and most likely it is if the child's still within the presence of the home, like Cain was, if it is still there, listen to me now, to correct it requires the whole family. It is very difficult to get it corrected because it's very difficult to get every, everybody in the family on the same page F with help and recover because it involves a whole family change of perspective. And it's very difficult. Now, the ideal thing, of course, is to deal with the truth and, and to have it. And the reason is the support. You see, when, when a child makes an error of judgment in some place, and then it gets manifested. He needs a support team around him. When the support team around him has also had that problem and also did an operation something that wasn't, it was a work system, and that work system has been passed on. We have to, in order for there to be a support system inside that family, the family has to change together. It's very difficult to get people to do that. It's very, very seldom to people. And I mean to be able to do it without guilt and shame and all those other things, just because everybody, it's not that one person needs help. It's that everybody needs help in order to be able to help them be healthy. And we can see this manifestation very early. We're still into Operation Works. No matter what you call it, we're still into Operation Works. So we can see this manifestation of it uh, in this family. Point number four, when they, when, when they disobeyed the command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they suffered the consequence of their sin. Now, I want you, when we get to point five, we're going to uh, we're gonna look at the changes that are necessary. But I want to show you something. I want you to write this on your paper because I didn't put it there. I ran out of space. So you, I want you to write this. This is under point number four. They disobeyed the command not to eat. Now, I want you to write down on your paper someplace where you've got enough space to write. I want you to write Romans 5, 12 through 21, and I want to break it down for you. <laughs> I want to break what they did theologically is broken down. Romans 5, 12 through 21. In verses 12 and 13, the sin. It's called the sin. Their, what the, their sin, they disobeyed God, is called the sin. It's called sin because sin is against God and it's against his word. That's how we know what sin is. The Bible tells us what sin is. We don't tell each other. The Bible tells us. And so they talk about the sin. That's in verses 12 and 13. 
And it's a mention, the word sin is mentioned again in 21. The second word that's used is in verse 14. It's the offense. It's called the offense. It's been called the sin, and now it's been called the offense. In verses 15 through 18 and verse 20, it's called the transgression. The same thing. It's called the transgression. In verse 19, it's called disobedience. See how difficult it is to put a tag on this? Genesis 2.17, don't eat of the tree. Don't eat of the tree. Now, that's, that's very simple. Would you agree that's simple? Don't eat of the tree. That's a simple. That's about as simple as it gets. But watch. When they ate of the sin, look how complicated the sin became. When they ate of the tree, look how complicated that. Now it's sin, it's offense, it's transgression, and it's disobedience. Do you understand the layer that went out from that? Don't eat of the tree. The Bible says they ate, and now theologically, eating is called sin, offense, transgression, and disobedience. That's just in one chapter of the book of Romans. And what I'm trying to say to you is that when God gives you a marching order, don't do this or do that, it's a very simple idea. Be obedient with it. Obey it. Do what God, because listen, God always has your best interests at heart. Always. He wants what's good for you. But listen, when you sin, it becomes so complicated in your relationship. See, all these are words of what happened to your relationship with God. Sin, separation in your relationship with God. Offense, a transgression, disobedience. All of these are directed towards your relationship with God. They're all offenses against the relationship with God. And now, how do I get that restored? I can't go back not to eat because I ate. Now I'm in this mess. So if I stop eating from the fruit, it doesn't change the consequence. If I, if I never go back and eat another fruit, I'm still done in. See, a lot of people think, well, if I just quit doing what got me in trouble, I'll be, I'll be okay. I'll just quit drinking. I'll just quit taking drugs. I'll just quit doing this. I'll quit doing that, and I'll be okay. Listen. That's not your solution. It's a spiritual. Now it's very complicated. How am I going to recover from sin, offense, transgression, disobedience? How am I going to recover? And listen, the recovery is just as simple as, as there was here. Now what do I do? I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Listen, when I believe it, then that covering covers up all of that. The blood of Christ covers up my sin. The blood of Christ covers up my offense. The blood of Christ covers up my transgression. The blood of Christ covers up my disobedience. And there is nothing else. There is nothing else. The fact that you never go back to the tree and eat again, it's not how you solve it. is broken relationship how do, how do I get that restored and we're all born in that state we're all born in that sin we're forced by one man Adam sent into the world and death by sin that whole ball game was passed to us that sin and death was goes back to Adam sin and death goes back to Adam when he says for by one man Adam sin entered into the world and death by sin we're talking about the sin death package but you see, it's bigger than that. If you go on and read, it's the sin package, it's the offense package, it's the transgression package. See, these are, all, these are all reflections of what's been lost. These things were never an issue when you, had, when you were in spiritual innocence. They were not an issue. Now they're a big issue. And how do I get them? 
out and get restored to spiritual innocence where I can be naked before God and my mate and not be guiltful, shameful, fearful. <clears throat> There's no human way you could ever figure this out. So God has done it in grace. He, put, he packaged that whole thing up simply in grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. He, 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 he puts that all back on the backside. He wraps it up in a, a really nice gift and says, it's grace. But you got to believe that. you got to believe it. When they discovered the commandment, when they disobeyed the commandment not to eat, they suffered the consequence. In the second chapter, verse 17, when the commandment was given, it contained a consequence clause. The first part of it says, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The consequence part says, and it's a promise. This is a promise. Now, we all love promises of God. Here's a promise. Here's the promise. For in the day, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I don't care how you get this in the day. In the day that you eat. You can put it on the calendar. In the day you eat. In that moment of that day. In that twinkling of an eye. In that moment of decision. In the day you eat. You will die. You will surely die. That's muth muth. That's a cal, cal infinitive with a cal imperfect. Dying you will die. And that's a promise. And so, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Now I want you to see something. This is really important. You have a prohibitive on the front and a promise on the back. If the prohibited is broken, if you do what I told you not to do, here are the consequences. Let me bring it down to where we live. Let's bring it down to our day. Walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16. Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you desire, this, the, this, if you desire the flesh, you, produ you produce sin. Sin produces James 1, 13, 14, 15. It produces temporal death. There's a prohibitive and a promise. And if you get into sin that you're not willing to confess, I'm going to discipline you. Because a fa that's what a father who loves a child does. Listen. Watch this. I put a bold print. God did not promise that they would receive knowledge if they ate from it. Now listen to me. Did he promise that? No, he did not. Then listen, where did they get that idea? Because they, listen to me now, they ate believing they would get that. They ate believing they would get that and not death. So where did they get that idea that they could eat of the fruit and get knowledge and be like God? We read where they got it in our introduction to Genesis 3, 4 through 11. The devil told them that. God didn't tell them that. The de now listen to me. Did they know what the word of God said? Yes, they quoted it to him. But they believed the devil. When they ate of the fruit, they believed the devil. They believed the devil, not God. Did they know what God said? Yes. Could they have believed God? Yes. But they chose not to.
That's why it's called disobedience. And what they did is called a transgression. And how it affected God was an offense. And what it was was sin. And God has to deal with it that way because he's a just God. When they violated it, now it's a transgression. God has to deal with it in a just way. He has to deal with the offense. He has to deal with the sin. He has to deal with the disobedience. He has to deal with it because he's a just God. Where did they get this promise? Well, they got it from the devil. The devil told them, For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And they ate from the tree, believing the lie rather than the truth. Listen, did they go to Bible study every day? Yeah, that's how they learned. And listen, was the Bible doctrine there like a Hebrews 4.12? Sure it was. Because in the end, they, they're reflecting all these different attitudes. They, got, they, have, they, have, they have shameful nakedness. They're full of guilt. They're full of fear. Full of anxiety. They're full of the things of this world. Uh, now listen to me. They did get what God promised. They did get what God promised. They surely died. And they did get what the devil promised. Their eyes were opened. But holy cow, they saw their unspiritual nakedness and it devastated their life. Their eyes were opened. He said, if you do, your eyes will be open to no good and evil. And the Bible makes it clear. Then they, watch this now, I put in bold. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew. It's exactly what he said. They knew that they were naked. But this time their nakedness is not unashamed. Their nakedness is unspiritual. Their nakedness is shameful. Now they've got to figure out a way to try to get back into the presence of God. And they do it through human good. And it's unacceptable. Because, listen, this is not only sin, it's an offense, it's transgression, it's disobedience. There's a lot of things the justice of God has to deal with now that they've committed sin. The question is, what did they lose? And what did they think Operation Fig Leaves would solve? Well, they solved nothing. Because they put it on the outset like closing and cosmetic, and the inner person was in torment. The inner person, even when they covered up the outer, the inner person was still naked. So how did that work? You know, Al's got a favorite line. Well, how did that work for you? What? Apparently it didn't work too good. Because, listen, the only thing that can cover, like you can cover the outside. You can put on all, all the facade that you want on the outside, right? You can put that happy face on. You can get through it. Put that little happy face on and get through it. But the truth of the matter is when you take the cosmetics off and you take a good look in the mirror, you know who you see? You see the real you. And how are you going to deal with that person? You're going to go into hiding. You're going to go into another layers. You, you know, you just keep covering up, covering up, driving the source of the problem away. Or you're going to get, you're going to get real with the issue. Let me tell you. Ask yourself, not how you got in your predicament. Ask yourself why. If you want to deal with your stuff, and we all got it, come on. 
Now, I'm not looking for hands. I just put mine up. I'm not looking for yours. This is not a holdup. But I'm telling you, there's, listen, when you ask the why, it moves you to another place. Every time you ask why, it moves you to another place. It moves you to another place because what you've got is a whole lot of stuff covered up that you haven't been willing to deal with. And listen, at some point, it's going to hit the fan. It always hits the fan. You know the proverbial fan. Listen, seven things, and then I'm going to close. There are seven things that we can learn from their disobedience. We can learn that the knowledge of the consequence, consequence of sin is our eyes being opened to divine truth and the lies of the cosmic system. Boy, did, they, did the devil do a number on them? Yeah, but listen, he did it with their permission. I mean, when they brought it up and said, Adam says, well, the, the woman you gave me, and she says, well, the serpent, and, and the, you know, all of that stuff, it still comes to the bottom line. I won't hear it. Because none of that, excuses doesn't resolve it. The Lord is still asking why, not how. I don't know how you got in that mess. It doesn't matter how you got in it. The issue is why. If you want to correct it, it's not how I got where I am. It's why I got where I am. I don't know. I don't know if you'll, you'll make it or not. I don't know if there's a real interest in change in your life. Maybe you just want to keep playing the old con game. That's a choice. For me, I've chosen not to do it anymore. I've chosen not to do it anymore. I'm tired of being un I'm, I'm tired of being naked and, uh, and ashamed before God. I'm tired of playing that. Because listen, it's the inner man that he talks to. He don't talk to the outer man that's out there skating all over the place and thin ice. He talks to the inner man. We learn that the knowledge of the consequence of sin is eyes being opened to divine truth and cosmic lies unspiritual nakedness, shame, guilt, fear, and hiding, absenteeism, and negative volition at Bible study. You want me to tell you where you are in your life? And you want me to tell you where your life is headed? I mean, dead end street for sure. Your absentees from Bible study and your negative volition when you're here. It is a, that's a clear sign in your heart. The inner man. And that's got change, and only you can do that. You can c continue to come and huff and, and, and puff and, and, and grind it out and hate being here and I wish it didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, the best thing to do is just change your attitude. Because whatever you got going for you is going to get you in a heap of trouble. There's going to be consequence upon consequence heaped up on your life. And listen, if that's what you volitionally want, then get ready to go for a rough ride. Or you can change your whole attitude. And so it be. Now, they were smart in this. They chose to change their attitude. They came back to God. We learned the hard way. Listen, we can learn the hard way that evil is not good and that evil is from the devil and good is from God. Now, you can learn that the hard way. They did. You can learn it the hard way. Why do we have to learn things the hard way when we learn them the easy way? People say, well, they're just bullheaded. No, they're negative. That's not bullheaded. That's negative. Bullheaded, they're negative, and they keep running into the wall. And we say they're bullheaded. The 
That's disobedience. That's negative volition, disobedience. And it's scar tissue being built up on their inner person. That's callous behavior. That's stupid. That's a whole lot of things that the, even the unbelievers go like, what's he doing? Oh, he's banging his head against the wall. That's pretty dumb. I know. I know, but he's, that's the way he chose to live. Three, we can learn that sin is a loss of spiritual innocence and spirituality. That hunger and thirst we had for God and his righteousness is, is weaned off. We have lost fellowship with the Lord. We can learn that sin is a loss of spiritual innocence. It's the loss of spirituality, that hunger and thirst for righteousness of God and for fellowship. We can learn that God is faithful to his promises no matter how it affects our lives. I mean, when he laid out that thing, in the day you eat, you will die. You think that was a... God was standing on the line cheering for him to do that? It was a heartbreaking deal. We can learn that God is faithful to his promises no matter how it affects our life. We can learn that no one is better off by sin than by obeying God. I can't tell you how many teenagers that I have to deal with that think that sin is where their life will be and obedience with God is all negative. But I can tell you it's not just 21st century teens that think that way. Come on now. It was around in the 50s, I know. We can learn that human good works, Operation Fig Leaves, is no substitute for the blood of Christ for, revolving, for resolving sin in our life. There is nothing but the blood of Christ that resolves sin. Nothing. Well, I think I'll change my life by changing yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-uh. No, you've just exchanged the operation works to something else. It's got to be a spiritual solution. If you want real change in your life, it has to come by a spiritual solution, not just changing operation works from whatever to whatever. You know, people, they, they quit smoking because they, they, it's wrong for them. And so they, they take up eating. Now, that's a normal idea, right? Every, everybody, just about everybody who is addicted to cigarettes, swap it out and get addicted to something else. My grandfather, he, he, he never smoked, but he always had a cigar in his mouth. Never smoked it. I don't know that he ever smoked. Well, I think he did for a while. He smoked wing cigarettes. They were about 14 miles long. Wing cigarettes. I remember how long they were. I don't know how you can remember stuff like that. But he always had this cigar, and, and he'd keep chewing that thing down because he liked taste of tobacco until he got lip cancer. They cut a big chunk of his lip out. And well, I threw that away. Not going to go through that again. And he, he took up eating these little round mints. You never find him without one. See, all he did was substitute it. He didn't correct his problem. He just substituted it. Operation Fig Leaf just went from one operation to another operation. That's not a solution an addictive behavior. That's not a solution. It, it requires a, it. It was a solution to what he had, but it didn't resolve the problem. It, it wasn't the how, it was the why. It wasn't the how, it was the why. You got you to resolve the why. <laughs> we can learn that what they were now experiencing the hard way, they had learned previously the easy way by faith and Bible class. Is that not crazy? What they're learning the hard way, they had already learned the easy way by faith in Bible class and threw it away. Now they're in trouble. Let us pray.
Let me make sure before I close this session that you understand the primary issue. And that is this, that Jesus Christ came into this world to go to a cross to die, not for his sins, but for ours. The scriptures taught that that's what he would have to do to be the savior of the world. That he would die for our sins according to the scriptures. He would be buried and raised from the dead according to the scriptures to give us life everlasting. There is no other way. Now listen to me, there is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So just exactly how does that work, Ron? It works this way, Romans 1.16. The gospel, which I just described, death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's not Operation Works. It's Operation Faith. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. If you believe it, you're saved. And not only you saved it for one day, you're saved for every day. He's going to remove all of that sin, all of that transgress, all of that disobedience. He's going to remove all of that through the work of Christ on the cross. And so I encourage your hearts, don't leave this place without saying, I, not only do I believe that, Ron, but I've applied that to my life personally through faith. Not only do I believe that with my head, I believe that with my heart. I've applied that to my life by faith. And therefore, I'm saved. Father, we're thankful today for, for, for this time together with these people. And I pray, Father, the message that has been presented here by the word of God would do its work deep down into our hearts of the reservoirs of our heart and soul and that that word of God would become a critic and a judge of the thoughts and the attentions of our hearts and change them to be compatible with the will of God. In Jesus' name, amen.